Hey, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Expand Your Team with PsyOps MDR. We have a number of people that are joining right now, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go on hold for maybe one or two minutes, and, and we'll start um, you know, about two minutes past the hour. So stand by. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, expand your team with PsyOps MDR. So my name is George Tubin, and I'm the Director of Marketing here at Signet, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Uh, before we get started, I just have a few housekeeping items I want to share with you to keep us on track. Uh, first of all, you'll probably all note that um, everybody is on mute. We are recording the session. Uh, we'll have about eh, 40 uh, or, or so minutes of presentation, and we'll keep some time at the end for questions and answers. If you have any questions, you can go to the Go to Webinar uh, question uh, box down at the right-hand side there anytime during the presentation and type a question in. We'll try to answer all the questions during the Q&A session. If we, uh, for some reason, don't get to your question, we will follow up with you directly um, and, and make sure you get an answer. Uh, within uh, you know, the next week or so, we'll send an email out to all attendees with a link to the webinar. Uh, if you want to share it or, or maybe there was something you missed that you want to hear again. And uh, finally, if you experience any connection or sound problems, please use the GoToWebinar chat function and uh, we'll do everything we can to try to help you resolve them. So with that, let me uh, let me move on. You you see his uh, handsome picture up there. Um, our, our speaker today is George Arvanitis. He's a solution engineer here at Signet, uh, mainly focused on the North American market. He works very closely with our clients as well as with our MDR team. So he has a lot of real life experiences around the value that, uh, that an MDR service brings and, and specifically what they do to help uh, clients. So with that, uh, rather than listening to me, let me turn the uh, baton over to George. George? Hey George, how you doing? Thank you uh, very much for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you guys for joining the, the webinar. We do really appreciate the time that you've taken out of your day to do this. Uh, and uh, yeah, very excited to talk about the MDR and how how they can kind of help the SMB market and, and help with the day to day life. What I wanted to do just to kind of start off is, is I wanted to give you guys an agenda so you guys can kind of understand what we're going to be talking about. Um, so kind of broke it down into a couple segments. Uh, we broke it down into just a little bit about Signet, uh, the, the need that we kind of see from an SMB market, uh, the, some of the key differentiators that we have from, from our perspective that we think kind of highlight us as well. Um, we're going to talk about the SOC, some of their capabilities, the, the team, uh, the overall analysis that they do, reports that, they, that they've done, kind of what they've been doing in the day-to-day, -day, uh, kind of what that interaction will look like. Um, and then I kind of want to walk you guys through a, a quick demo just to show you some real life alerts that we have and kind of the interaction and what that would look like from the SOC utilizing their knowledge and their understanding and, and also from your perspective, just what the sign up platform can provide you 
uh, in terms of capabilities and, and forensic view. So that's our kind of our plan. Now, the next thing that I want to talk about is let, let's talk about the need. So this is something that we've we've heard from a lot of um, you know demos that we've done, a lot of talking with uh, prospects uh, from our customer base and and just from research and everything. And you know we we've kind of boiled it down into a couple areas that that the need is that we're kind of suiting. So obviously a lot of the SMB market has small teams. Um, the small teams have a lot of responsibilities. Now, you know, you're wearing multiple hats, you're having common day-to-day -day actions that you have to take, and and that's kind of the, the where that starts from and stems. Now, additionally, we're also seeing a lack in budget, right? So, you know, from a cost perspective, a lot of the what's out there can be very cost effective, cost uh, high, and, you know, especially if you have to have multiple solutions, it's kind of hard to get your environment protected accurately. Now, and, and also really with, with the perspective from those, small teams, really, you're, you're kind of seeing a, a lack of resources, really, right? Because we, we talked about how everyone has multiple hats. Everyone's kind of stretched really thin. So there, there's a lot of issues that we kind of see there and, and uh, you know, not a lot of uh, capabilities from that standpoint, just because you are you have so much in your day-to-day, -day, it's 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 hard to have that capability. And, and also, you know, since you're wearing multiple hats on a day-to-day, -day, security may not be your, your focal point. You may be someone that has some experience, but it may not be something that you know you're as engaged on a day-to-day -day basis as most people or as some security experts are. So that's the, those are kind of the the focal points that we see really, and and that's where the need is for for us for the SMB market, and that's kind of what we're focusing today on on the demonstration. Now, some of the differentiators from the signup perspective that kind of make us unique is the for one the the simple price model. Right, a lot of the times when working with SMBs, you know, we have to keep everything simple and easy to to digest. Right, so we work off a simple price model. Uh, it's per endpoint per year, just to just to make it easy and, and uniform. There, in as what you'll see as part of the solution, there's no nickel or diming, and really what that means is, you know, everything that we have to offer, everything that you see in a demonstration, everything that we show you is, is all built under the price. There's no gotchas. There's no additional add-ons that you need. It's it's all it's all in the same kind of cost perspective just to make it easier and and you know because we we generally feel that you know there and when it comes to security there really shouldn't be a lapse in that and and everything that we have to offer should be offered right out of the box and from an engagement perspective we we have the ability and and then this is coming from the perspective of the science team they have the ability to to assist you guys with several different variations of engagements so it could go down the the road of a simple question asked and uh, provide a simple answer. It could go down the the road of also crowdsourcing information. You know, how do other customers in the in the base typically handle these scenarios? What do they do? Best use case scenarios. How can we help? And and you know, just the kind of having that crowdsourcing option as well. Now going past that, you have your your scenarios where there is a remote IR or remote engagement that's needed. So what, what you'll basically see is a, a simple Zoom session where you'll have a SOC analyst jump on with you and help you through the, the whole process from beginning to end and uh, help you kind of fully understand the scope of the problem, where it's gone to, where was the initiating thread, where it started from, um, and they even have the ability, as you can see in the forensic reports, to put everything in a, in a report for you guys. Now these reports can be high level, can be also very detailed different analysis, static analysis and behavior analysis. And I'll show you guys some examples of that as we go. Now, I wanted to talk about the team, uh, the PSYOPs team here. So they are 24 seven uh, as a response. And and really the, the, one, the amazing thing about this team is their professionalism. It's, it's a, a large group of very talented individuals that kind of live and breathe the security space. Uh, there, I've I've seen him do some amazing things and help customers that are in very interesting precarious precarious scenarios and help them re help them really out of it. Now, kind of leading leading the charge here is uh, Sharon, um, and this is a you know a direct quote from him, and and really you can kind of uh, understand you know the this is this is basically a passion for them. Security is a passion for them, and and that really reflects in the in the way that they can help, the abilities, the capabilities, and, and everything of that nature. Now, 
from a perspective of the capabilities, you know, we talked about their capabilities and kind of wanted to break them down into a couple different uh, variations here. So what you can see is, you know, we have the obviously the availability of 24-7. Uh, it's an ongoing operation always, uh, both proactively on demand and, and customer specific needs. So you can reach out at any any time you need them. From an alert monitoring perspective, there's a continuous management of incoming alerts, classifying, the ability to prioritize, contact, reach out to you guys, and update validation on active threats and, and assistance. So there's a unique effort there uh, at where the, you kind of see them as an extension of the team. From an exclusions and whitelisting perspective, you know, let's face it, there are uh, occasions where there are certain things that pop up that uh, are unique to every environment and there's really no way to avoid it. So they're there also as a quick help guide to help you whitelist something effectively and without uh, opening up too many gaps for you guys as well. When it comes to remediation elements, uh, they can provide a lot of conclusions from an investigation, uh, give you concrete guidance to different customers um, on which endpoints, files, users, networks, and traffic should be remediated uh, as kind of that's how we perceive the environment. So give you very much detail onto those kind of four elements and across those elements as well. From the perspective of the on-demand uh, analysis, uh, customers have the ability to send suspicious files to be analyzed directly to the SIOPS team. Uh, you can do this directly through the console as well and get an immediate verdict on it to get an understanding. And then, you know, when it comes down the road of attack investigation, uh, this is your, you know, your deep dive into validating the attack by bits and bytes, uh, getting a perspective, getting a full understanding of the scope and impact, uh, and then, you know, basically providing you guys with the IOCs, the areas of compromise that uh, you need to focus on. And then, you know, lastly, the proactive threat hunting. Uh, you, you see this on a day basis. They're constantly working behind the scenes, uh, getting information from our threat intelligence feeds, uh, from the crowdsourcing information, things that are happening in the environment, and and investigating and, and looking at that uh, proactively. Now, we talked about the reports and the analysis. You know, I, I wanted to kind of showcase some of the recent reports uh, that they've published. Um, these are all available to you guys. Uh, on the signed up website, we can even share a link uh, so you guys can take the time to look through them. Uh, some really, really, really uh, great information here, uh, really good resource, a great way to get an understanding of the different vectors, different areas. Um, and it's, you know, great, great uh, read if you have some time to, to spend just to kind of understand, you know, their capabilities, their, their findings and everything. Now, we talked about the reports, the forensic reports that they can provide. So from this perspective, you know, this is kind of an example of a simple forensic report that they can provide. Now, something high level has an executive summary, has all the indicators of compromise that they that they found, and a conclusion, something that you can take to share with the rest of the team, uh, share in the company, have a general overview, understanding of what's going on, what you need to focus on, um, and have that all in a, in a report that you can share. Now, additionally, you have your scenarios or you have the team members that need something a little bit more technical, right? So from this perspective, wanted to showcase also some of the capabilities from a more technical forensic report. So in addition to the, the high level report, we can also have indicators of the behaviors. So you can see they can take a behavior analysis and, and provide very detailed information with, with regards to that. They'll even statically analyze uh, a threat and provide context as, as that. And you really, when you're wearing the hat uh, of a someone for forensics and investigator, if, if your main day-to-day uh, -day is looking at threats, uh, you'll find these reports very interesting and provide a lot of information for you guys. So it's it's very uh, very intuitive, very uh, focused, depending on how you need it, and all concise. Now. Next, next stage, basically, you know, I, I wanted to to spend some time really to kind of go over a, a demonstration. Uh, but you know, before before we go over the the demonstration, I kind of wanted to talk about what what you kind of see, what to expect on here. So you know, at at a first stage, what we'll be looking at is we'll be looking at some sign-in alerts. Um, and basically, we're going to be taking these alerts and and seeing all the information that we provide natively into, into the platform. 
Um, we're also going to be exploring a little bit the automation capabilities uh, from a response and investigation perspective as well. And finally, you know, kind of how the, the SIOPS team interacts with everything and how, how they can kind of help, uh, recommendations that they'll make, uh, different use cases, uh, that some of their capabilities. And, and we'll, we'll kind of focus basically on some real live alerts. Uh, in, in this specific instance, we're going to be talking about Imotet. So for those that aren't familiar, I'm going to give a little bit of history background of Imotet, uh, just so you have an understanding of what it is. Um, basically talk about how it's transitioned and how it's changed uh, throughout the years. Um, and then we'll kind of put on our analyst hats in, in this. And I'll talk about from that perspective and, and you know, really understand how the SOPS team will help in the day to day. Now, obviously we'll, we'll kind of give you the information for those that don't know, we'll, we'll kind of fill in so you know what to look for. And this will be coming from the perspective of, of the SOPS team. I'll kind of put my hat on as a SOPS member here. Um, but also, you know, for those that do know, you can also see in the alerts from that perspective, how easy it will be and intuitive it will be to to look at this all this forensic information as well. So it's kind of that that is the the plan. So what we can do really is we'll we'll kind of kick off the the demo here. So let me just end this here and let me just drag over this screen here. And uh, I just want to make sure everyone can see my screen. It's all visible. It looks looks good, George. Awesome. So what I'm showing you guys here is the, the sign up dashboard. Um, this is the kind of the first thing you see when you log into the platform. Uh, what we're kind of showing is the areas of collection that we have. It's a single agent that's collecting all this information and, and uh, fusing it into an understanding. Uh, we'll see that you know in the in the alerts. Um, and that's kind of the purpose of it is the, you know talking about all the different areas of of content that we're providing and forensic information through these four quadrants here. So what we'll do is let's kind of flip over to the alerts. We'll start at the bottom here. So let, let, let me let me start off by giving you guys some context. So like I said, we're going to be talking about uh, Imotet. Um, so those of you who don't know, uh, the Imotet is a banking trojan. Uh, the first kind of initial sample of it was identified in, in the year of 2014. Uh, Imotet was later classified as a stealing banking credential trojan. Uh, it basically did this by hooking into internet traffic of the online banking banking sessions, um, and and has kind of changed uh, as the years have gone by. So you know, in the year of uh, 2017, we saw kind of an evolution of Imotet. So it, it evolved into one of the most dangerous droppers, uh, packing some really extreme sophistication capabilities, utilizing different tactics, techniques, and procedures to to uh, to its end goal. Yeah, in, in the recent year of uh, 2019, Imotet became one of the most uh, common modules in the spread of banking trojans and ransomwares. Uh, so, you know, it not only did it uh, take its actions, but it also had some nasty little presents that it would drop for you after it did that. Um, now, you know, fast forwarding into 2020, um, you know, with with all kind of that given in the, in the background, COVID, we won't, we won't talk about it because at this point, I'm sure everyone's kind of sick of hearing that. Um, we saw a change in it. Um, we small, we, we, you know, we had a small period of, of peace really when Imotet, uh, uh, went away and then it kind of came back as a, with a new chain of execution and it evolved, you know, f and switched from using an executable file in the traditional sense that we saw before to using a binary. So a DLL file that gets actually dropped. The DLL files generally, from what we, we know, get loaded through the run uh, run DLL process, run DLL32 process. Um, and it, you know, to add uh, matters to make it worse, uh, they've also, from an evolution perspective, added a fake error message in the Microsoft Office documents as well. Now, everything that I'm kind of going to cover, um, they, we have a more detailed report that the SIOPS team has done, actually, uh, that you can read on our on our website. You know, like once again. Can share that information with you guys, and and really, you know, what we're kind of trying to to showcase here is the capabilities that we have in detecting, but and also, you know, how you can utilize the SIOPS team to get an understanding. Now, s some additional context that I wanted to also provide here, so that we know, so we can kind of relate that to what we're seeing, or for those that aren't too familiar with it. Um, from what we're seeing with the alerts here, so in order to avoid any common type of detection. Um, 
you know, the traditional uh, opening uh, child process uh, detections that uh, you see kind of traditionally, uh, we, we saw that uh, Imhotep had executed a, a not my parent technique, uh, which basically enables it to kind of break the process tree chain, the traditional sense from, from having a Windows document that spawns a child process as, as an early indicator. Um, we know that in the past, Imhotep, in this case, uh, in this wave, used the WMI tasks for processes, uh, which basically enabled them to create some processes to avoid any behavioral detections or of a parent process or child. So some of those detection mechanisms. We also found that Imhotep uh, was using the WMI class to spoof the process executions uh, and then execute basically under the uh, WMI PRVSE.exe. Um, and then under that, and, and basically under that malicious process command, you'll be able to just see, see just that in the alerts. A uh, little feedback and a little understanding for the WMI PRV process is it's a DCOM server. Uh, and it spawns the DCOM service host under uh, svc.exe, uh, which is executed in, in the kind of the following parameters of you know the the path to svc host and then the dash k DCOM launch basically. So you know what we'll kind of start off with here is the the alerts. So you know you're you're going through your day to day here, and uh, you get this uh, PowerShell alerts. You get this also malicious command. Here. So there's a couple things you, you'll see here and get an understanding. So we'll see that the instance of PowerShell was what was detected. We'll see that the target host is this uh, victim one, and then the user that's being utilized in this in this case. And this is just some quick information as well. We'll also see if there is an auto remediation that was taken on it. And, and some of these we had to disable the auto remediation just to kind of allow the, the execution to happen. But what you can see when you expand this alert here, you can actually see that in the process tree here, you'll see that WMI that we were talking about kind of as the initiating factor. You also see, if we kind of scroll down here, that there is uh, that WMI uh, behavioral abuse that was done. Um, and we can kind of see that as well as native into the, in the alert. So you kind of have these indicators here, you know, and, and you know, we're coming from the perspective of the SIOPS team, right? So this is uh, knowledge that they have. And this is knowledge that they'll provide to you guys. So this is kind of how the uh, investigation would go. Now, obviously, these are indicators that are, are common for, for those that know. And those for, that don't know, that's where the SIOPS team comes in to, to be able to help and provide that kind of context as well. But, you know, like I said, we're, we have the kind of the hat of the, the SIOPS member now. So, you know, kind of scrolling down, you can see here that there was an actual execution in PowerShell. So this is uh, something that was encoded. So it's something nasty like this. So, you know, at this kind of stage, at this kind of stage here, you can see basically that, you know, there's there's something that isn't necessarily obvious for you. So what you can do at this stage is, you know, through the alerts, you have the ability through the here to use the analysis and send a SOC. That kind of initiates the communication with them to kind of get everything started and going. Now at the same time, the the SAP team is looking at all the higher critical alerts as well. So they're already seeing the the context and, and seeing the metadata from these alerts. So they're they're starting kind of the investigation process. Basically, what that looks like is a deification of the PowerShell command. Even though it was detected and prevented, you can see um, here in an indication that if we kind of look at this uh, PowerShell, we we see two different ver alerts. And the reason for that is the alert here that we're detecting is the abuse of the WMI that we saw. But then this is the actual alert that's in regards to the PowerShell specifically. Now. What you can see here is similarly to what we saw before, there was an action. You can see that the encoding flag is here. So we know that it's it's an encoded base64 and have an understanding. Now, for those that that uh, are able to decode it, they can, you can kind of start that process of, with that. But also knowing that the cyber team is here, they will start the decoding process. And really, you know, what, what they'll find once they do decode it at a high level is that the PowerShell is basically attempting to download uh, a new instance of Imhotet from a different domain. So that's kind of the initial findings well, once we start deophisticating the, the alert. So based on the investigation that they've done is the, the kind of the next thing you'll see is that there were some DLLs dropped. So this in this indication here, what you're seeing is, you know, as part of the investigation, the Imhotet binder actually will download a new directory. And in the user path and, and the payload will be kind of dropped in a DLL format, but it's it'll be sat in the user directory. So you can kind of see that uh, behavior here as well. So it's, this DLL is being dropped into the user directory. Uh, 
Now, not to kind of end there, but the next process that it actually will take is that it will run another process. Uh, it'll be a, a run DLL32 instance, and in will be triggered into a different uh, directory. So in the actual app data local directory. So you can see an indication here of that. Now, something interesting to, to note about it is that uh, you can kind of see the, the extension here actually. So you can see that the extension itself isn't actually a, a DLL, right? Uh, and that's because as part of the process, uh, the Imotet actually will rename and copy the initial DLL, DLL to a new location and then leave this uh, variant of, of a renamed file. So it's not as obvious. So you can kind of see that that dropping here and you can see the detection based of the AI mechanism as well. That's what detected this specifically. Now, if we kind of look at the uh, parent process, you can see here that uh, there was an execution that was run. Uh, you can see that DLL and the user utilizing kind of the control run DLL here. So there's indication of, of that. And that's kind of where that execution is happening here. So we have some information that's that's really relevant and and you know helpful. So for those that do know, and, and like I said, we're gonna have the hat of the the PSYOP team here. So these, this is all relevant information. That's an indication that this is some variant of Imotet or and then specifically the most common 2020 uh, variant of it because it has some commonality. It's no longer using an executable file. So from here, you can action a couple different things. So from the perspective of the uh, SOC members. So after the deification has started, uh, what they'll basically do is um, in the command line, they'll find the domain addresses. Um, so they can basically suggest for you to start looking in those instances uh, and get an understanding basically of, of that. And you can do this by, by clicking on the file here, right? So first kind of stage is that they'll see that there are uh, some instances here based off this DLL. If you look at the occurrences, you can see that that's that's the occurrences of that device. And now let's let's take our our host specifically, right? So the next kind of stage here is let's look at the files here. These are all the files that that ran, and we know that everything is being run through the run DLL process, right? This is coming from the information that we have that's that's visible. We'll take the information from the time frame of the alert, so we know what what specific instance of it it was. Um, so if we kind of uh, scroll down here, we'll, we'll look at let's look at the instance of the time frame, and the alert itself was triggered at uh, 1:27, um, and it's around this 15:34 uh, time frame. So we know that. So if we we actually open this uh, run DLL, we can see that there's a reference point in the specific instance of it to that uh, VVL uh, binary that we were talking about and that command was done. So let's, so kind of the, the next stage here really will, will be, let's look at this run, uh, the specific occurrence of it. So we know now from the deification that this specific instance um, was attempting to reach out to the web. And we can also see this specific occurrence and the actual domains that it was attempting to reach. So if you take these domains, you can also plug them into virus total. You can see that the indication that this is um, a variant of the Imotet. So there's kind of that visibility. So this is kind of how they would steer you into, into an understanding. So from this, from this kind of understanding now, so we know we know it's a variant of Imotet. We know that there was an attempt and, and, and obviously it would be blocked if the remediations were enabled. Now, kind of the next suggestion is, you know, based off what we know of Imotet, it tries to gain persistency by modifying the auto run registry key. Now, what the the SAPC will make a recommendation is since we know that it's uh, directly on this specific device, you have the ability to do some, take some actions here. So whether it's on the specific file, whether it's on the specific host as well. So there's a couple of different things we can do. So if we go back, let's look at the perspective of the actual host. So we're kind of back on this victim one that was kind of the, the initiating factor here. So with that persistency, we know that it, it tries to do it in the auto run registry. So one of the things that they would suggest is utilizing the run command, they'll have you run a WMIC account to get the SSID, for example, of that of the different user accounts. Once Since we know what user is associated with it, will basically run a query for that specific uh, SSID for that user, utilizing once again a command through the, through the run commands against the actual current version run. 
uh, and be able to kind of get that information uh, out of there as well. So we kind of have that visibility and then be able to take an action on it uh, in addition. One of the other things we'll do is, you know, once once we kind of go through that run DLL process that we saw before, since we have those additional um, addresses that are being reached, there's a couple different things that we can do from here. And these are some of the recommendations that they might make for you guys as well. Um, you may be utilizing the uh, NetSH ad, uh, advanced firewall rule, uh, just a common uh, firewall rule where you can actually take the specific IPs. You can do this through the actual run command and uh, that will actually block these IPs that they found. And you can do it on a, on a wide scale as well. We're just kind of showcasing running it directly from the specific host, but you can definitely do it on a grander scale. And additionally, for example, if we look at, we kind of go back here, but let's go back to the alerts. So that's kind of the initial indicators. Now, in, in popularity and in our commonality here, this instance of, this specific instance of Imhotep, for example, tends to have a nasty little partner that it runs and will drop as well. In a lot of cases, it's the Ryuk, uh ransomware, um, which kind of gains its infancy. And, and you know, it's one of the, the, the nastier uh, ransomwares as well. So you can kind of see that we have different indicators uh, and uh, auto remediations that get taken to, uh, automatically against this alert. Now, some interesting things you can do, or in the, and they might also suggest from the perspective of the SIOPS team, is well let, let's look at how this alert was triggered right so this specific alert is interesting because you know we talked about uh basically from a detection perspective there there could be detections based off the next gen antivirus it could be behavioral detections there could be uh uh in memory detections that we have but also this this is a very unique uh, scenario where we detected it uh based off the uh, decoy files so these are ransomware specific files that we dropped a disk uh, and it's really just another way for us to uh, be able to detect and help against the ransomware initiative, right? And and these will action a remediation as well. So this is an interesting uh, alert, which is why we're kind of showcasing it here. Now, additionally, you know, some of the other things that Ryuk will do uh, as part of the process, it, once again, it's utilizing the the WMIC in this case. And what you can see is one of the, the nasty things that it tries to do is actually delete the shadow copies, right? So in, in order to delete the, the backup that you can, the restore from a backup that you can do. So really, you know, what we're kind of showcasing here is that not only can we detect it from a perspective of the, the command or the, the attempt to utilize the, the but we also prevent it as well. So you can kind of, that's why you're kind of seeing two different uh, approaches to it. Now, kind of going back to, to the Ryuk here. So if we look at the file, for example, we're kind of getting an understanding of why it is what it is, right? So it, why it's malicious, some commonalities, some artifacts associated with it and everything. And and really what's important here is one of the suggestions uh, from the SIOPS team that would be used, we could, let's take the hash value. So so what, what we found actually in a recent uh, iteration of ARC is that uh, it tends to drop three additional files for persistency. And from there, uh, from those files really, one of the things that we noticed is that in in a most risk, most uh, recent rendition, at least that we found, is that they all have the same hash value. So we can take the hash value as a reference. We can utilize now utilizing the forensics, and this will be something that the the SIOPS team will will recommend. We can add a, a value for hash. So we can say, you know, let's let's take a look at where this uh, specific ha hash consists of, right? So we'll put it in here. We'll do a query. In this case, obviously, we, we're finding an instance for it, uh, so it's visible. But say, for example, once we've taken the remediations actions against it uh, and there isn't a concern with it, we want to know basically if we see this uh, iteration of it again. So what you can do is through the safe policy, you can create a custom alert. The custom alert basically will allow you to create a custom alert that you kind of see from over here. And you can kind of give it also designation. You can give it a, a policy name. You can basically also additionally give it a risk score. So from that zero to 1000 based off the importance for you. Uh, obviously in this scenario, you'd want to put it as 1000. You can also open up uh, that alert like we talked about and also give it a severity level. And, and effectively what you're doing here is you're creating a, a trigger for a custom alert for just this variant of it. Now from here, one of the things that the SAPS team may recommend is to build a auto remediation for it. Uh, once again, you can take a couple different actions here, but basically what you would do is uh, you would take the alert name, 
or you can basically just kind of utilizing the regex or and this is just a direct alert name that you created you can even take the the hash file of the the client uh, of the instance as well it, it totally up to you, you know, what information or criteria you specify and then you can actually say let's take a quarantine action and hit save and effectively what you've done is that custom alert that you took you can actually utilize it uh, and and run this uh, quarantine anytime we see this in the future so this, this is some of the recommendations they'll, they'll make. Um, obviously, some additional facts and information is um, utilizing the run command. You can also run some, some queries for scheduled tasks to see uh, if there are persistencies there. And if there are, create custom alerts for those and also even action or remediation against them or, or just take an outright remediation against them right away. So there, there's a couple different things that they can recommend. And, uh, you know, really, you know what the the important thing here is that there's no there's no limitations here. So the the Epstein, from the perspective, they're they're here to help you guys until we come to an understanding that everything is covered. Uh, they can be reached at any point in time, 24/7. They can be reached through the platform, and then utilizing the built-in remediations or the auto remediations, you can see kind of how uh, with their help also and the platform capabilities, you can take uh, remediation either from an ad hoc perspective just to clear it out, uh, and also build an automated uh, response so that in the future, if you see these variants, you automatically have all the built-in rules that you need to to take up even more more uh, advanced remediation. But you can see here all these alerts that were triggered. These are just the built-in remediations into the platform. So it can also be set it and forget it. But we kind of give you that ability to kind of grow with the platform as well. So that's kind of that's kind of what I wanted to to showcase. Um, you know, I wanted to to also give some time, you know, for some questions, um, and and do that uh, do that as well. Um, I do, you know, really want to thank everyone for for taking the time out of their day to to join and kind of talk about some of the capabilities and and you know, what we can do. Um, but but also, I want to uh, you know bring it up to you guys, see if there's anything that I can answer for you. Um, basically, or, or anything like that. Hey, George, uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, that, was a, that, was a, that was a really good presentation. You covered a lot of ground. Um, so let, yeah, let, let's spend a little bit of time answering some questions uh, that we're getting in here. Um, and I'll, uh, I, I, think, I think you covered this, but the, it, the question is getting asked, so I'll, uh, I'll pose it up there in case other folks have it. Mm -hmm. the, the platform itself, the question is, does the, the sign-up platform only do detection or will it uh, actually block uh, threats from um, you know, the environment or, or the endpoint? The, the sign-up will do detection and can also do remediations as well. Okay. So, if, so once it detects um, a threat, it could isolate the threat or uh, you know, kill the threat or... Mm -hmm. Take a number of actions. Yep, yep. You have preventative actions, and then you also have the ability to kind of add your own kind of twist on it based off uh, different criteria that you okay. want to do. Cool. Uh, there's another question about compatibility of the Signet platform with uh, other antivirus software. So if somebody had uh, AV installed and they wanted to install the, the Signet platform additionally, I, I think that's what the question is getting at. Um, can mm -hmm. you talk about that? Yeah, um, uh, it's a really good question, actually. So what we do see uh, a lot also uh, from from by comparison is, uh, you know, we, we do have the ability for ourselves to replace, you know, a, uh, your traditional AV or kind of we have that built in functions as well. Um, but additionally, also, um, you kind of have the option, right, to take the action of disabling our AV and utilize us with uh, another vendor as well. Now, keep in mind, you know, we really want to make sure that it's just strictly an AV in this case, uh, because, uh, you know, that's kind of the the commonality importance here. But, um, you know, at, at the same time, you know, we, we do kind of have that functionality and capability. So we, we, we have had uh, a lot of, uh, you know, customers do that in, in, the, in the past. And we also see a lot of scenarios where we replace an AV too. So kind of flexible from that perspective. Oh, okay. Very good. I think that, I think that answered the question. 
Um, here's another question. Uh, is the SOC team, the PSYOPs team, um, are they uh, Signet employees or uh, do, do we use a third party for that? That is uh, also a very good question. Um, they are all uh, Signet employees as well, actually. Okay. So no, no outsourcing there. Then there's another one. Where, where are they generally based out of? Yeah, so they, they are based out of Israel. Uh, but they do work in a 24-7 capacity. Ah, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, here's another question. As a client, do we put limitations on the number of times uh, you know, a, an individual client can contact PsyOps for help or guidance? No, not at all. Uh, we... You know, we, we don't think that, like I said, like kind of showed in the presentation, we don't nickel and dime, right? So there's no add-ons that you need to purchase for um, reaching out to them or anything like that. You have the ability and the kind of the flexibility to reach out uh, in any capacity, in any frequency that you guys need. Okay, cool. Uh, another question, um, can the SOC team uh, actually take remediation steps? Um, you know, if, if they see a threat in the environment, can they remediate the threat for the client? So they, we can't take actions uh, by ourselves. Uh, we need the permission and we need to have someone from the team there uh, and available uh, to, to do that. We can make, we can definitely make recommendations. We can definitely uh, do help with, a per, with your permission and, and do that, but uh, not, uh, we won't do it without any permission or anyone on the, on, from, from the team. Okay. And I have one. I have a question that's kind of very specific, and so you may you may not have the specific answer, but it may be something we can get back with. Yeah, of course. Uh, they want to know if the signup platform can be installed specifically with Sophos Intercept X. Um, I would say, from my perspective, we haven't had a scenario where we've run that uh, both at the same time. To to be uh, totally honest. Um, uh, I would say often most likely no, uh, but uh, I would think that the best case would be just to take it offline, uh, specifically just to just research to be able to give a more educated answer. Okay, yeah, I, I thought that <laughs> that would be uh, pr pretty uh, a, a fairly uh, specific question that you may not uh, necessarily know the answer to, but some somebody here in Sinet might. Okay, yeah, uh, no, we can definitely get get some information there. Okay. I think that's that's all the questions that I had coming in. Um, so with that, I think you know, we'll, we'll call that the end of the webinar. Um, if you do have any additional questions, please you know feel free to send them in, and we'll make sure we get back to you with a direct answer. Um, you know, we'd be happy to do that. So let me uh, once again, George. I want to thank you very much for sharing your insights on the topic. I want to thank everybody for joining us today, and hope we'll see you on an upcoming uh, sign out webinar. I think this will uh, conclude our webinar for today. Take yeah, care. Thank everybody. you, everyone. Thanks, George.